Megan Detlar. She's coming here from Drexel. She is a recent uh, tenure track assistant professor in the Department of Neurobiology and Anatomy at Drexel. She received, I, I learned this today, she received a BS in chemical engineering. And that was in uh, the University of Michigan. And she got a PhD in neuroscience from Ohio State in Columbus. Yep. And um, she uh, came to do to work at Drexel in the laboratory of John Houlet, um, who she did a postdoc with. And I will pass you over to Megan. Hi. Um, okay, so the podium is muted, so now I'm on the mic. Um, so thank you for having me today. I think this is a really great opportunity uh, for me uh, to share with you guys a little bit about what um, I'm setting up and have, have been doing actually for quite a long time. I'm a, a new uh, assistant professor. I've been in that position for about a year. I've been at Drexel for almost a decade, and I've been studying pain and spinal cord injury for close to 20 years now. So while I'm new, I've really been doing this for quite a while. Um, uh, before I get started, I think it's really important to acknowledge my uh, funding sources. I've been very uh, fortunate to be funded at every stage of my career, but this uh, here represents, uh, I'm, the data that I'm going to present is largely uh, work that's been funded by uh, an R01 from NINDS, and uh, work from the, uh, is also being done uh, in support uh, by the Craig H. Nielsen Foundation, <clears throat> and of course, um, the Spinal Cord Research Center at uh, Drexel College of Medicine. So I, I don't want to belabor uh, the uh, point here, uh, as many of you are familiar with pain, and all of us have some uh, understanding from a personal experience what, what really uh, pain is. But the International Association for the Study of Pain defines pain as an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience that's associated with actual or potential tissue damage. Um, it's, I always tell my medical students uh, in class that it's a perception, it's subjective, and it's protective. So, uh, you know, we really need to understand and, and keep in mind that the experience of pain is very different from individual to individual, and that it's also a necessary requirement for us to, to keep us protected and to keep us in, in you know, greater terms to protect us from uh, being hurt. Okay, and, and I also put this uh, history lesson in here. Um, <clears throat> since I'm talking at a college of medicine, I also think it's important to talk about neuroanatomy and, and to give the you know, history, not just from what you see in a textbook, in your medical neuroscience textbook, but what, what actually history uh, describes. And this is an image that's very famous. It's from Rene Descartes. He thinks, therefore he is. And he, he gives us this, this drawing that is, is the first um, real neuroanatomical pathway uh, of pain. And he says that the particles from the fire jump from the fire onto the boy's toe, where it travels up a dainty thread, and it rings a bell in the brain. OK? And, that's, and, and that, in turn, is, is what we're talking about as perception. Spinal cord injury, which is a model that I use of, of neuropathic pain, is pain that arises when you have damage to the nervous system. This can be the peripheral nervous system or the central nervous system. It, that could be the uh, spinal cord or even a traumatic brain injury, something uh, in those lines. Neuropathic pain is different than when we stub our toe. It's described as burning, piercing, electrical pain. Uh, it's intractable. And in those with spinal cord injury, it affects about 55 to 85 percent uh, of those individuals with onset around six months post-injury. Um, and it's really refractive to treatment. <clears throat> One of my friends who has sustained an injury really discusses this and calls it the pain of everyday living. And it, it's things that you and I would take for granted are perceived as painful. 
So I also included this more modern version of the pain pathway because so I think it's important. And for those neuroscientists in the room, we, we know this as figure 24-12 from the Bible or Kandel and Schwartz. Um, <clears throat> where it shows us different levels along the uh, neuroaxis at the spinal cord, in the medulla, the pons, and then up into the cortex. And, and there are several neurons. We know from Descartes that Descartes was, was actually right, okay, that there is this thing, and that it has to be transmitted from the periphery, from the skin, for those particles to come in from the fire into the spinal cord. And my lab is really interested in that first neuron, that first link in the pathway of perception and that are the neurons that are located in the dorsal root ganglion. And DRG neurons are very important and they transmit not just pain information, but they also can transmit, transmit uh, proprioceptive information where your limb is in space. That's very important if you're trying to navigate obstacles or walk along a sidewalk, just general uh, things, pick up your, your spoon for your lunch uh, to feed yourself, those types of things, uh, information from your viscera. And, and from a rehab perspective, since we have some people interested in rehab in the room, um, it's also these, this information from DRG neurons, this primary afferent information that comes into the central nervous system really is what I think drives activity dependent plasticity. So in our lab, in my lab, I have a really broad research focus to try to understand the cellular and molecular mechanisms that um, um, are underlying injury and exercise on nociceptor or pain neuron plasticity and the development of pain behavior. And we do this by looking at uh, studying several different themes in the lab, some of which are um, uh, delineated here. The first, and what's highlighted here in bold black print are the topics we're gonna uh, look at a little bit today. So the first is that exercise is a rehabilitative therapy that can, be pre that can prevent or reduce spinal cord injury induced uh, chronic pain. Um, and the um, second major tenant and major thing that we're gonna talk about today is how we're starting to really consider and ask questions about how pain is an effect of the interaction between the nociceptor and its environment. And today we're gonna to talk about one of the um, potential immune cells, immune cells that can interact with nociceptors to drive excitability and this aberrant uh, and uh, chronic uh, pain. We can do that by looking at these cells called macrophages, myeloid cell recruitment and macrophages in the dorsal root ganglion, and also look at uh, cytokines and chemokines uh, as they go. And throughout all of this, I want you to remember that as a, someone who was trained by a physical therapist um, in graduate school, it's really important to use what we have and use the tools we have. And I think that exercise and rehabilitation is a really important tool to help us di to dissect pain, uh, pain uh, reduction uh, mechanisms. So, one of the, so just a little bit of background about spinal cord injury um, so that you guys get uh, a little bit of um, perspective here. Spinal cord injury uh, is a relatively small population of people that it's been reported that there's more than 250,000 Americans that have sustained a spinal cord injury that are living in the U.S. with upwards of 11,000 to 17,000 additional uh, injuries per year. That number has also been reported as a total population as being over upwards of 1.2 million, though um, I think we need a little bit more information there. It's predominantly uh, male, uh, people who sustain it, with a mean age at 42. Now this number has changed drastically over the course of my scientific career, and a lot of that is due uh, to increases in falls in the elderly. So we're seeing a lot more an aging population in the US and, and with that comes um, those types of consequences. Where it used to be motor vehicle accidents, sports accidents, uh, things you know for the daredevil young guys driving their car too fast around the curve, you know, now we're starting to see this, this, these sort of two populations of people who are injured. What you can see on the uh, right uh, the right side of this 
uh, picture is a, uh, an MR of a, a spinal column. And you can see here in this uh, that I hope you can see my arrow. It's kind of small. But uh, here in the middle, that's your spinal cord. And these are your vertebral bodies, your discs, uh, uh, your spinous processes. And what you can see here is sort of this classic impingement. This was somebody who had, a, had sustained a motor, motor vehicle accident. You get a burst fracture of the vertebral body, and you see this sort of squishing of the spinal cord. This person would go on to be uh, taken to surgery, have a decompression surgery done, um, and their spine stabilized. So what I'm trying to do in the lab and what we do for a long time and what we've done at Drexel for more than 35 years is, is to uh, use clinically relevant uh, spinal cord injury models in the rodent. And so on the left here, you can see a cross-section of post-mortem human tissue of, from the Miami project uh, to cure paralysis. And you can see here in white uh, the outline of a spinal cord, and this in white represents spared tissue, and in the dark coloring here in the center is the actual lesion site, the hematoma and the lesion. And in the rat, we can, we can also create contusions, and now in blue, you see this spared, uh, spared tissue, and you see this uh, void it, and cystic cavity that forms within, I mean, this is at six weeks post-injury, but you can see evidence of a cyst as early as seven, as seven days. So you end up with this rim of spared tissue that is relatively similar to what you see in humans. I should say that in our model, we do, the, we do our contusions on one side of the spinal cord. That's because we're, um, we're initiating these injuries at the cervical level at C5. Um, <coughs> oh, excuse me. <coughs> and, and so we want to make sure, because respiratory centers run in the cer upper cervical parts of the spinal cord, that we're not, um, we're giving them the best chance to maintain respiration and therefore life, all right? Um, and when we do this, we can then uh, use a variety and we use a battery of pain tests, many more than are listed here actually now, um, to test different modalities of sensation. We use a von Frey test and the work that I'm going to show today, I'm only showing you one uh, type of behavior test for pain, though we, I have information and would be happy to talk about these other um, models. Uh, behavioral assays, uh, where we're looking at tactile sensation, the Hargraves test where we look at heat, and then we also are starting to embark on uh, mechanical conflicts or uh, avoidance paradigms and looking more at operant behavior. So rather than us evoking a stim using a stimulus to evoke uh, behavior, we're asking the animal to make a choice between a bright aversive light or walking across a runway of uh, nociceptive pins or probes. So when we do this, when we test for pain after the spinal cord injury, and we look on the side, excuse me, on the side of the animal, the forepaw of the animal on the side of this cystic cavity, on the side of the spinal cord injury, what we see is we actually see two different cohorts of animals emerge. The first here is in the dashed line represents what we would call a normal paw withdrawal threshold. And then you see one cohort of animals denoted by the red squares, where they show a marked reduction in paw withdrawal threshold, and another subset that maintained normal sensation that's represented by the green lines. And this has gone out, we've carried the animals out as far as um, 84 days post-injury, and we see that they maintain their phenotype. Once they are in showing this hypersensitive behavior, that's maintained over time. What's super cool is that when we look at the um, contralesional forepaw, so if we look at the forepaw that's on the other side of the animal, we see that the animals that were in red here, they're plotted in red on this graph, and they also are hypersensitive. We see this little blip here in and really, in this group, because you see a lot of compensation, because they're really not able to use this one paw very well. So you see this sort of, they're more hesitant to withdraw their paw um, on the contralesional side, and that's, that seems to be a compensatory mechanism. What I really hope that you can take away from this slide, though, is that it's really a 60-40 split between those animals that develop pain 
which are here in uh, red. 40% of the animals develop pain after the spinal cord injury, and 60% of the animals maintain a normal sensation. The graphs I didn't include are what's going on in the hind paw, and what I can tell you is that in these animals that show hypersensitive behavior in the cervical dermatomes in the forepaws are also showing hypersensitivity in the lumbar uh, dermatomes of the hind paw. <clears throat> and that's published from my postdoc work. To take this a little bit further, I think I'm an anatomist at heart, and what, what we know is what we're looking at here is we're looking at the, the distribution of primary afferent fibers that come in from the DRG. So here's, if you focus on panel A, the outline here is the gray matter of the spinal cord. And what you can see here in green and in blue are two different populations of pain DRG neurons. They have these two arms, right? One that's out in the periphery, in the skin, and the muscle, and the bone. And it's measuring and taking in information. And then it's got its central arm that brings afferent information into the spinal cord. So what's depicted here in green and in bright blue are two different types of pain. Oh, I don't know. I'm just going to close that. So what you can see here in green and in blue are two different types of pain neurons. Those that are uh, labeled in green are CGRP positive or peptidergic nociceptive afferents, and those that are blue are IB4 positive or isolectin B4 positive, and those are non-peptidergic neurons. What's really important is that these two different types of nociceptive neurons, while they're not, uh, while they both relay pain information, they don't overlap. They're, inputs into the spinal cord under normal conditions, there's very little overlap. And animals that have been injured, have a spinal cord injury, but do not show pain behavior, we still don't see very much overlap. But in those animals, that 40% that were in those red squares, we see that there's a heightened uh, and extended uh, uh, topographic distribution of these, of these afferent fibers. So we can also look, and this is a new direction for the, for the lab, is, um, is to start looking at electrophysiology of those dorsal root ganglion neurons. So we see that anatomically there's a difference, and now we're starting to try to ask questions about the excitability and, and their spontaneous behavior um, after an injury. And so that we do whole cell patch clamp electrophysiology, on DRG neurons that we isolate from either normal or spinal cord injured animals. And what you can see here, this is in current clamp, you see two traces, that of a normal, um, <clears throat> of a normal um, animal's uh, dorsal root ganglion, and you don't see any of these little, these spiky things, those are action potentials. Um, and when we just hold in current clamp in the injured animal, we see many more instances where we see spontaneous activity of these, um, these nociceptive neurons. So, and this is the quantification for that. Importantly, we see that on, on both sides of the animal, on the side with the giant spinal cord injury, the big hole, and on the other side. And we also see it in the lumbar, spinal, uh, the lumbar dorsal root ganglions as well. And so it suggests that there's this spinal cord injury is inducing and, and overall excitability or systemic excitability all along at many levels of the spinal cord. And this is, is uh, neurophysiological data that would support our be the behavior that we see. And this is preliminary. The studies are ongoing. Uh, today I'm waiting, anxiously awaiting some results. Um, and so this is sort of hot off the press from a postdoc that joined the lab two months ago. So the other component to this is, and it's no secret if you are in the pain field or if you're in the spinal cord injury field, that the immune response and that inflammation are huge players in, in, in contributing to uh, injury and also in contributing to pain behavior. And so we wanted to take a DRG-centric view and not a spinal cord view and look at some cell types that are immune cells and that contribute, are known to contribute to an inflammatory response. And so what you can see in these, um, in these images are three uh, images from a normal, uninjured control animal. 
uh, that has normal pain behavior, one that has a spinal cord injury uh, 35 days after a spinal cord injury but does not show allodynic behavior, and one that's injured that does. And so what you can see in sort of the purpley color is a cressel violet stain for nuclei, and in, in the brownish color are these cells that we call macrophages. They're stained for ED1. And when you count the number of macrophages in the uh, dorsal ganglion, or cells that are ED1 positive, you see that there is a greater, significantly greater number of these immune cells in the animals that are injured with pain compared to animals that are injured that don't have pain. So what I've shown you so far is that this unilateral mid-cervical contusion injury of the spinal cord can generate two distinct behavioral cohorts, those with pain, those are in the red squares, and those that maintain more normal behaviors, those are in the green circles. We also see pain-dependent alterations of nociceptive primary afferent fiber distribution in the dorsal horn. Preliminary data that suggests that there are changes in electrophysiology, electrophysiology uh, of those same neurons, and that uh, there is altered presence of macrophage or infiltration of monocytes into the immune cells, into the dorsal root ganglion, where those primary pain neurons reside. So on to the next part of the talk, we're going to talk about post-injury exercise and rehabilitation. <clears throat> so exercise is a, it's very important to understand that exercise is a potent modulator of many things. And after spinal cord injury, it's especially important at maintaining muscle size and decreasing atrophy, improving locomotion or motor performance, reducing spinal refluxes, uh, promoting uh, neuronal survival and normal function, as well as it can modulate inflammation. We can actually do this in the lab, and, and I, I have a rat gym at Drexel, um, and so where we have animals on forced motorized running wheels, which is the video moving in the, in the bottom center. On the top, top part of this panel, you see a, this is a, an animal that is actually uh, trained to pull on a lever for a food reward. She has to pull at specific forces. I can change that so that they have to pull harder and hold it and then slowly release it or they don't get the reward. So there are a lot of tasks that we can do. And the video that's the cutest that I apologize is not working is the one of the rat on the motorized bicycle. So that's what that is. So we really do have, have, have the full uh, 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 gym there, um, you know, Planet Fitness for rats. So let's see if we can move on. Okay, so when we do aerobic exercise in our spinal cord injured animals on the on the aerobic running wheel early after the spinal cord injury at five days prior to when we can detect pain behaviors, the presence or absence of pain behaviors. Now you're looking at this blue line. You see that. Uh, they maintain normal, um, normal uh, levels on the von Frey test. And this corresponds to an 83% reduction in the incidence of pain. So I have uh, now only a handful of animals out of, we're up to over, that's a rat that decides to stop walk, walking. So she looks like uh, clothes in the washing machine. Um, but you see this uh, a re dramatic reduction, and we're up over 50 animals. So this is, we're really um, confident in this number. When we, when we look then at a delayed exercise situation where we wait until pain is established and start exercising animals at either 14 or 28 days post-injury, uh, once pain is established, this is what we see. We don't see any change. We're not able to, to reverse um, or attenuate. I was hopeful, but it didn't hold out, um, that we would see this as it goes on. But we really, with that same exercise paradigm, weren't able to get this recovery that we saw. And when we look at the sensory afferents, what's highlighted now in, in red, this is the same that we saw before, right, where we see the two populations of nociceptive uh, DRG afferent, the afferent information coming into front to the spinal cord from the DRG, you see that 
that the, in both groups that still have pain at the end of their, um, at the terminal time point, uh, they have this dramatic overlap. And those animals that were early exercised do not. And this has been quantified and uh, published. The next part, and what's really interesting, is if we, we've started, this is work that's funded uh, currently by the Craig Nielsen Foundation. Uh, I'm really excited to look at different types of exercise and modalities of exercise. Strength training for a spinal cord injured uh, person is critically important. It's important to help maintain their independence and their ability to transfer from their wheelchair to their bed, their bed to the chair, their bed to, the, to uh, some place in their sitting room. So upper extremity strength is, is probably paramount to their independence, okay? So this is a very clinically relevant thing, and it's something that I really wanted to explore. So we started these protocols, and, in, and when we look at, at, just to remind you, in, the trained, uh, an, untrained, in an untrained situation, we have the 60-40 split. When we do this early after injury and we look at their trained paw, because we only train one of their paws on the ipsilesional side, we're not seeing any recovery. Their untrained paw, not surprisingly, isn't any different either. When we look in a delayed situation in animals that have pain and, and then measure at their end point time point, so at, at 84 days post-injury, and we look at that ipsilesional forepaw and we say, do they have pain or do they not have pain? We see this reduction. I honestly didn't think this would work. And when we look at their untrained paw at that same time point, now this was in an animal that when it started strength training was in the, would be categorized as pain, we're not, we're not really doing anything about it. So it's suggesting that the activity of that movement is really critical. That increased afferent input because of having to pull the lever to get the food treat is somehow beneficial at reversing a sensory uh, deficit. When we, look, when we look at the afferent um, information, this is uh, sort of our sneak peek first look uh, this is this is what I can tell you. So <clears throat> we don't. I don't have it completely quantified, but I spent a lot of time last week on a microscope, look, taking pictures and looking at at slides, and I couldn't believe this. So the early strength training on the ipsilesional side, you see that there's overlap. These are animals that don't recover. If they had pain, to, if, we can't tell if they had pain to start with, but the animals that have pain at the end point, they still have this overlap. And those that were trained on their ipsilesional side that convert to a no pain phenotype from a pain phenotype, it's reduced. It's not perfect, but it's reduced. And when we look at its contralesional, untrained contralesional side, we see that the overlap is there. I could have picked any number of images. These were the ones that um, I opened up first. So uh, this, is, this is really a representative uh, section. I have a very talented graduate student in the lab who um, named Soha Chaya, and she she's really working on trying to understand a lot about what's happening in the immune response in the DRG after a spinal cord injury. And I showed three of these images earlier: <clears throat> the normal, the injured with no pain, and the injured with pain. But now we're adding that early aerobic exercise, the one where it was preventative and prevented pain and hypersensitivity from developing in the paw. And you can see that there's really relative, there's very few numbers of macrophages. We see that uh, there is a reduction in the number of macrophages that are present in animals that have the early aerobic exercise and that this corresponds to their, the presence or absence of pain. So in an, the animals that have um, higher numbers of uh, ED1 positive cells, they're more sensitive, they're hypersensitive than those that have lower numbers of ED1 positive cells. Um, they're um, maintaining normal sensation or even potentially a little hyposensitive, which is another uh, caveat. So 
to kind of summarize the second part, the type and timing of rehabilitation matters. Early aerobic and late strength training exercise can reduce the incidence of spinal cord injury induced pain. And that really lends, uh, sort of gives a little bit of uh, weight to the hypothesis that there's a, a strict time window where exercise can be therapeutic. Um, we know that it can modulate afferent sprouting and we know that we can reduce macrophage number. So our next questions, and really the bulk of SOHA's uh, graduate work, is trying to understand when this infiltration of myeloid cells occurs in the DRG after spinal cord injury, and is the dichotomy of nociceptive behavior that we see after our cervical contusion mediated by the injury and or specific immune responses. So what we're actually doing is we're doing a series of time course studies where we're looking uh, at very early acute time points um, to try to understand uh, when the myeloid cells are recruited to the DRG and whether or not they're sustained. And so what you can see in, in the uh, histology panels here are images of dorsal root ganglion, uh, uh, cervical dorsal root ganglion, that are stained for ED1 or CD68, as it's known. And you can see that we see these large cells coming in very early after a spinal cord injury. This is at C7. We also see evidence of this in the lumbar spinal cord, which is more than 20 segments away. Um, and that, that this kind of persists. And we, I've shown you the figures uh, earlier from uh, more chronic time points. We also have started doing uh, quantitative uh, PCR to look at markers, immune cell markers um, in, the, in, the, um, in the DRG, oops, and, and in the DRG, which are represented here. So on both of these graphs, the quantification of, of the immunohistochemistry and also in looking at the um, fold change of this uh, gene uh, expression you can see that there's tremendous variability at these early time points, which suggests that there may be some type of predisposition that could generate our 60-40 split. So she's since gone on, and she, th these data, she's running some experiments in the lab where she's looking and trying to understand um, with Increasing this in, right now we have an N of six in every group. We've got it, we're going up to an N of nine, and just sort of the preliminary graphs of that is showing that this dichotomy is really holding as we increase our power. And that's very interesting. And so when we see these, one, a difference in number can suggest that there is a, a difference in the amount of inflammation and amount of things that are going on there. But more doesn't necessarily mean bad when it, we talk about macrophages, because they have very diverse functions in, in their immune response. And especially after SCI, there's not really that much difference. Um, oversimplifying some things, we can say that there is a, a continuum of macrophage function, but we can sort of roughly categorize. No, I still don't know what to do there. But we can roughly categorize them into M1, or more pro-inflammatory functioning macrophages, or M2 macrophages that are pro-resolving. Obviously, this is much more complicated than that, but uh, for the purposes here, this is what you need to know. And that the, the general idea is that if you have more M1 type macrophages, you will have more pro-inflammatory cytokines around the, in the environment uh, that are secreted. And if you have more M2 type macrophages, you'll have more anti-inflammatory uh, macrophages that are secreting, uh, and you can look at their secretome. So we looked again now in the DRG at M1 and M2 macrophage uh, markers, and this is qPCR data, and I want to highlight this, this uh, sample, this rat here, that's got the red dot. So an M1 marker is CD16. Uh, when we look here, uh, CD16 levels are low. But when we look at CD206, which is a marker of an M2 macrophage, that level is high. 
Now it's not also still, I said, it's very complicated and there are a myriad of factors that contribute to, to the phenotype of these cells. But this is one example of many that we fi found that um, we're trying to uh, sift through now. Uh, we're, we're working out uh, principal component analysis uh, for many different factors. Um, and, and looking again at, at secretome. And this is the same thing. So if you look at, at the same sample, we see elevations in pro-inflammatory cytokines, TNF, IL-6, and INOS. Um, and, and again, we're, we're going through um, some PCA analysis as we up our power um, over time. So here is the take home for this. So, in the lab, we're really trying to understand alterations in the DRG after spinal cord injury and exercise as it pertains to pain. And what we know is that pain develops within 7 to 14 days. We can reliably get measures of, of pain behavior after the injury. We know that there are alarm signals, chemokines like CCL2, our monocyte chemoattractant 1, CCL5. There are a whole host of them that, that go off early and transiently in the DRG that will cause an influx in macrophages in, into, the, into the DRG that corresponds to primary afferent sprouting. Oops, wrong way. And we see an increase in pro-inflammatory cytokines in those animals that develop pain. So once pain is, pain is there, we see evidence of sprouting, macrophages, and cytokines. Oops, keep hitting the wrong way. We also have some, some preliminary data uh, though it's growing bigger every day, looking at nociceptor excitability, and we have a really strong suspicion um, that the excitability and increased hyperexcitability and increased spontaneous activity of these nociceptors is really a potent contributor. And we know that when we give exercise, at di different types of exercise, at different times, that we can potentially mitigate some or all of these things. Man, oh my God. So with that, these are, these are uh, really my, my concluding thoughts, uh, working hypotheses, and what I really hope that you guys think about. Post-injury rehabilitation can have off-target analgesic effects. It's not just about restoring motor function. It's about improving uh, sensory function, autonomic function. There is a lot of literature that's really up and coming on this topic. So think about that. When you think about someone with a spinal cord injury, they really are not just somebody that's limited to a wheelchair. They have a lot of other issues that rehab can actually uh, help as well. My other, my other uh, big thought, and this is really there for anybody in spinal cord injury, is to really think outside the cord. People in the pain field really have thought about the DRG for a long time, and people in the spinal cord injury field really don't, don't think so much beyond, beyond that. We don't like to think about the brain, and we certainly don't like to think about the DRG. So for, for all of us, I think that it's really important to take a more systemic and holistic approach here. Um, <clears throat> and finally, what I, what I hope I have conveyed, or at least got you thinking about, is this idea that pain is a conversation between a macrophage and a nociceptor, and a nociceptor and a macrophage. And we, we really want, we really hypothesize that it's the diversity in the immune and inflammatory response in the DRG that could really explain the presence or absence of pain. So as I, as I stand here and am, am speaking, um, my postdoc and graduate student are, are actively patching today on animals where we have modulated the macrophage response and the infiltrating uh, immune response into the DRG. And we're going to try to understand what's happening in those nociceptors. And from an immune perspective, we're really trying to identify and, and bring forward some flow cytometry and fact sorting to, to get at how these macrophages, what they're doing who they are, try to identify the population of cells, and what they're secreting. And with that, I'd like to thank the people who did a lot of the work, um, my uh, collaborators, um, my uh, funding sources, and you for your attention. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Yeah, in the back. 
I was wondering if you can um, preempt uh, all of these, all of this pain relief with exercise before the injury. Yeah, so that's a really great question. So what I didn't uh, spend much time talking about is that uh, for the strength trained animals, we act, because it's an operant uh, training paradigm, they actually have to be trained beforehand. So that takes about four weeks, maybe six weeks if we don't have a lot of personnel on the project. Um, and we don't, in our control animals, which we have now, our con animals that are pre-trained but then don't receive the strength training after, we're still seeing a 60-40 split. Now I can't tell you that in our aerobic exercised animals because I haven't done those experiments. But what I can tell you is Linda Watkins, who's out in Colorado, who does peripheral um, models of pain and is very interested in, uh, in immune and inflammatory mechanisms, that early, that exercise prior to injury can be protective. But I don't see that in a spinal cord injury situation. Yeah. A lot of fun stuff to think about. Um, a couple of quick questions. One is, what strain of rat do you use? Yeah. So we use a, a Sprague Dolly, uh, Sprague Dolly rat, which is outbred. Um, and these are all in females, what I've presented today. So in spinal cord injury, in the spinal cord injury field, we are one of the few fields that uses uh, female rats, and that's largely because there are a lot of bladder uh, complications that occur in these animals, and it's much easier to care for the female rats, in, and we have fewer instances of bladder infections and things like that. But we do have experiments ongoing in males. Very cool. I was um, curious because there's some uh, nerve injury models in which strain has a yep. big deal on the percentage that exactly. develop pain. Exactly right. um, the other question I had was in relation to your exercise. When you show your lack of effect, that's with uh, about four weeks of exercise, is that correct? Yeah, so the data I didn't, yes, it is with about four weeks of exercise. What I haven't shown you is that I've also, I've taken animals out as far as 70 days in the wheel walking exercise. I know because you're, that's one of the things that you do. Take them out 70 days. We also have animals that we early, and we still see those analgesic effects chronically. What's super cool in those early animals is that we've also taken a, a set and we've exercised them for about a month, and then we stopped exercising them for six weeks, followed their pain behavior, and we see a prolonged effect of that early exercise. So that, that we see, we, we still see, we see some animals coming back, coming in, higher instance, so about 18% of our animals are, are hypersensitive as opposed to 7%. But what that says is you maybe only need intensive PT rehab for four to six weeks, and then you can have maybe some kind of uh, maintenance dose one or two times a week might be sufficient to keep you pain free, and wouldn't that be nice? So, yeah. Hi. I think you mentioned that the images you showed of the macrophage staining were in the cervical ganglia. Yeah. Do you see that all the way down? Yeah. So we, what's really cool, and I didn't, I didn't show it, um, is that we haven't quantified in the lumbar DRGs. But so the injury is at C5. The DRGs of the four pod dermatomes are C7 and 8. So those are the ones that we've quantified. And then we also look at L3, 4, and 5, and we see evidence of macrophage infiltration as far and on the contralesional side. So, yeah. One of the things I think is so fascinating about this model is that most of those neurons are not injured. Correct. So what do you think is the initial signal that's recruiting the macrophages? Yeah, so that's an excellent question. And that's one that we, that's actually what drove the entire, my R01 and, and uh, what, what we were trying to do. And the first experience, experiment that I did uh, for preliminary data was I looked at CCL2 levels in the DRG. Uh, there's a, if I know that you know this, there's the glial hypothesis of pain uh, really is suggesting that, and there's 
the knockout experiments where if you knock out the receptor to CCL2, you don't see pain and things like that. So I said, okay, in spinal cord injury, what's happening? We, and so we see this early, almost immediate spike that then of CCL2 protein that then is back to normal at three days. And I think that that is actually mitigated. That sort of action signal is neuronal, that it's neuronal release potentially, or it's the satellite cells. In the DRG? In the DRG. And I think that, so what we have, I don't know if I can, let me see if I can get to a picture quickly. Da, 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 da. Just, just so that we have a frame of reference. So what we have, right, in, our, in my model that we use is we damage this side of the spinal cord. So if you imagine your DRG coming in, bringing afferent information in at the level or plus or minus a few, right? That gray matter's gone. But what's damaged, so what, what really is probably damaged at the injury epicenter might be the large diameter touch fibers. So I think that, you know, the, the part, the thing that's really fascinating to me is the idea of phenotypic switch and the idea that these neurons are talking to each other potentially through the satellite glia networks and things like that within the DRG. They don't have dendrites, but they, they might have, you know, other ways of communicating. And so I think that there is, there's something to be said about certainly in the lumbar cord or over here where this DRG the primary sensory neurons are not damaged by the injury directly, right? They're not mechanically damaged. That the presence of the monocytes there have to be coming from, from somewhere. So whether that takes a little bit, we haven't done the, the time course in the contralesional or the lumbar DRGs, but at chronic time points, I can tell you that they're there. So if it's delayed or, you know, because there's some other systemic immune response, I, that I can't answer. But I can tell you at four or five weeks after the injury that we see them there. So it's just, it's really an interesting thing to think about. You know, who's the signal? Who, what's the bat signal, right? And who's sending out the, sending that call? And is it, and so the experiments we're trying to do now is we're trying to manipulate the monocyte infiltration for 48 hours after the injury, and then we're gonna let the animals go. Keep, keep them out and look at behavior. So do we just delay a macrophage response? Right, that's one question. Or are they gone forever? Is it really this transient thing? And then what happens to the pain behavior? And then what happens to the nociceptor, right? So. Is it something that the CCL2, because neurons have CCR2 receptors. So we're not ma manipulating the CCL2 spike in the DRG. We're letting that happen. We're saying we're going to stop the monocytes from coming in, potentially. And we're trying to look at, tease out some of those things. So that's, that's kind of where we're going and what we're, we're really starting to think about um, in the lab. But I could talk for days <laughs> about anything, really. Any other questions? Yeah, in the back. Um, so I'm um, just wondering if you look at the motor function recovery in your animals. Yeah. So that's really an important, an important thing when we're talking about an animal that has an sp incomplete spinal cord injury that has a natural recovery to some extent, and then when we add rehab on top of that. Here's what I can tell you. So our animals that are are injured, they have forelimb deficit, predominant issues in their forelimb. They have issues with forelimb hind limb coordination, especially within that first few weeks after the injury. They love to kind of look like little old, old, old people walking with a cane, right? So they kind of hop along a little bit. And, or they'll develop, they'll try to develop a tripod gait where they hold this, this arm up against their body and walk with the other three. I don't like the tripod gaits so much, so, um, we, we, when we put them in the exercise wheel, we keep them at a pace where they're forced to use all four limbs, okay? So a running wheel for us, where they can, it's just in their home cage, can be kind of daunting because we don't know if they're walking with all four limbs or they're just going as fast as they can with their three legs, which they can go very fast. Over the course of, of a month, if my mom were to look at a cage of rats that were received this type of spinal cord injury in their home cage, she wouldn't be able to tell the difference. You can still see deficits. There are some uh, issues with their paw. Um, Scott Stackhouse can talk a lot more about that. Uh, 
Um, but they, they do have some minor deficits, but locomoting, feeding themselves, grooming themselves, that's all pretty recovered. A lot of the deficits in spinal cord injury really is um, determined by the level and the complete the level of the spinal cord that you injure and also the completeness so how big of an injury do you do in at that level so and will sort of dictate recovery do you see a correlation between the motor function versus the pain or no pain no so what i well let me put it okay so it's not quite that simple but uh, what I can tell you is if I correlate with injury severity. So what I did in, my, in part of my work as a graduate student was we did many different severities of injuries. It was a different model than this, but we looked at many different severities. And, and as we looked at tactile sensitivity or at thermal sensitivity, so Von Fry or Hargraves testing, what we can, I can tell you is that very my with sensory testing related to heat sensitivity, it seemed to be mitigated by the size of the lesion. So at the same level of the spinal cord, if the hole was small, they would have more normal hyper or responses to heat. If the hole was big, they would be hypersensitive. The bigger the hole, the more sensitive they were. And I didn't publish that data, and I kick myself about that all the time, because it's very, that part is very, to me, is saying it's descending modulation, right? If you, you lose your de, the descending modulatory component, then now you have a spinal reflex arc, right? That's, and that's why you're getting that trigger a lot faster. In terms of tactile sensitivity, it seemed to be an all or none thing. It wasn't sort of a, a, the, a straight, a linear relationship. Once the milder injuries tended to have normal sensation, and then all of a sudden you hit this moderate to severe contusion where you would have about 20% sparing at the epicenter, and then all of a sudden you would start to see animals that had pain. And then as the severity then increased, you would see more and more hypersensitive animals to the Von Fry. In terms of motor recovery of those animals, that seems to also be a little bit graded um, and a little bit more linear, though there are specific points, things like stepping, uh, that's kind of an all or none thing. Um, and that's a critical uh, point for a person or a rodent with a spinal cord injury in terms of their locomotion. So there are certain stages that are definitely related to the severity of the injury. But it, in general, you know, they say the larger the injury, the less motor recovery, and it's sort of the larger the injury, the more pain, right? I mean, so it's sort of less is more, right, in that regard. So. I don't know that that completely answered your question. It probably didn't. I probably skirted around, but. Uh, um, I have another question. Yeah. Um, it's the electrophys uh, experiment you're doing. Yeah. Um, the slides I thought was on day seven you're measuring it. Yeah. Are you looking at a time course response for Yeah, that? so the first thing that I was trying to do, well, that was for preliminary data for my R01. And so we're trying to, to, to show that we can do it in the lab and, and to really get that up and running. And we wanted not just can we patch from normal DRGs, which don't spontaneously fire. We wanted to say if we injure and injure animals, can we see differences, right? So am I still successful at patching? That was sort of what that was actually for. And what we're doing with the, that, uh, in that prep is we're actually looking at chronic time points. We're looking at different exercise paradigms. I mean, this is the, these are the goals, right? The milestones. And then look at different exercise paradigms, different intensities of exercise, manipulating the macrophages, and looking at what's happening with these neurons. And so that's where we're hoping to go. Um, I can tell you from work from my collaborator and mentor, Terry Walters, who's at uh, UT Health down in Houston, that in the spinal cord injured, animals that have a mid thoracic contusion. So in the middle of their back, not up in their neck, he sees hyperexcitability and spontaneous activity in DRG neurons as early as three days and as long as he's looked. And what's 
unfortunate maybe about the model that he uses is that 95% of the animals that they can generate with that level of contusion develop pain. So he's anxiously awaiting for us to do these chronic time points where we have pain and no pain behavior cohorts. That, that we can get at. Is there an excitability issue or is it really something that's not happening from that initial first link in the pain pathway, right? You know, it's amplification and excitability at every neuron in the sen ascending sensory axis. So if we can't, if it's already there or it's non, doesn't matter whether it's pain or no pain, then we got to look somewhere else at a way to where we can address some things. Anybody else? You had one in the middle. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, sorry, I might have just misheard. In your delayed aerobic exercise yeah. paradigm, it, it, the I think the circle you showed, showed is 97% of the animals are in oh, pain. Is that okay. a switch or is that pain, animals yeah. that were in pain previous continue to be so in pain? So it depends on which one we're talking about. So let me clarify that because that's very important. I'm like, I have to, oh, it's because I have to be in the slideshows. Okay, so it's here. So in this one, where we do the wheel walking, right? And when we add it, these are animals that have pain to begin with, all right? And then it doesn't get any better. And then if we go to the ones where we do the strength training, that's where it's a little bit confusing. Okay, so all of the animals in the delayed column, they started with pain for simplicity. They start with pain. So these are converters, right? And so the, they would all be red at the start, and so they've, we've reversed it. In their contralesional untrained limb, they don't reverse it. So it says that it's the activity of, of pulling or pulling against gravity, right, the, the, the load on the paw that's doing something. That it's not a systemic thing here, right? That it's local. In the aerobic exercise, I think it's systemic because it affects all four paws the same. But we also are manipulating all four paws because they're walking on the treadmill, right? So what I'm actually doing, and what we're at, I'm hoping to get a co-op student this fall to do this or in the uh, winter semester, is to create a high five so the rats, instead of having to pull the lever and hold it and release it to get the chocolate, they have to just touch a force plate. And they can't push the force plate because that's very different. I just want them to touch it. And then I want to see. And then we'll start making them push at the weight of one quarter of a rat's weight and see what happens there. And then we'll get at whether it has to be the load or not. But that's a very important question. Thank you for that. Yeah. Did you control for the time between exercise and pain threshold testing? And if you did, did you look into the effect of sympathetic tone on the pain response? Oh, that's a very good question. So we always test our animals first thing in the morning, so before their exercise. Because our aerobically exercised animals get very, very tired after the, they tend to take naps after they, they go for exercise. Wouldn't that be nice? Um, so, so we tried to do that. We don't test them on Mondays. We test, do a lot, almost all, if we can do it, on Wednesdays. So that's, you know, they get the break on the weekend. Um, so we want to make sure, and certainly in a complete transected animal that goes on a motorized bicycle, they look very different on the, on the bicycle than on Monday than they do on Friday. And they're a lot more spastic, right? on Mondays, and on Friday they're a lot looser. And so, so we try to do any kind of testing that we do, we try to do in the, in the middle of the week, certainly for, for sensory stuff, and we try to do it before they've had their exercise, because that also will, will make it, you know, they've had a significant rest period. Yeah. Anybody else? I'm here all day. Okay, thank you very much.